My name is Kelly Pack. I'm the Senior Director of Trail Development here at RTC, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar on the topic of routine maintenance costs for four season trails. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists today. Um, we have Yvonne Mwangi, who is our Trail Development and Trail Link Coordinator and is our lead on technical assistance here at RTC. Tom Sexton is RTC's Northeast Regional Office Director, and he is our lead on maintenance. Joseph Siernick is the President and CEO of Schoolkill River Development Corp, branded as Schoolkill Banks. It's a nonprofit organization working with the City of Philadelphia to revitalize the Schoolkill River corridor from the Fairmont Dam to the Delaware River. As part of today's webinar, we're really excited to have all of these three presenters provide some great information about routine maintenance. I just wanted to walk you through the outline of the presentation today. We'll have Yvonne share a new and approved section of our trail building toolbox on the topic of maintenance, along with other resources on RTC's website. Tom Sexton will introduce planning and budgeting tools that help determine the cost of base level maintenance tasks, which once accurately determined and differentiated from rebuilding and life cycle costs will help show the merits of trail investment. And then you'll hear from Joe and Tom discuss how determining routine maintenance costs is important in two different trail examples. We hope these presentations prompt conversations with more trail managers and planners in order to capture cost data that can help you better plan and prepare for routine maintenance costs. Feel free to drop questions in that Q&A box for our discussion at the end. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Yvonne to share more about the resources you can find on RTC's website. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, development coordinator here at Delta 2017. And for this section of the webinar, I'll briefly take you through some of the resources that you can find on our website, rails to trails So rails to trails provides technical assistance to individuals and communities that are looking to get trails built locally. Some of this we do through direct technical assistance, through email and phone calls, but we also try and provide these resources uh, on our website, rails to trails.org for free. Um, today, I'll be highlighting just two of these that are relevant for the topic we're discussing today. So the first one is our trail building toolbox. So this is a collection of articles that's written about how to build a trail really from conception down to planning and design and of course management and maintenance. Um, this toolbox is organized under headers that discuss different aspects of the trail development process. And uh, under the management and maintenance section, we have a brand new maintenance basics page that I will be discussing. So here's a preview of the page. Um, the maintenance basics page really just talks about the things that a trail manager needs to think about um, and have in place in order to keep their trail um, usable and safe for all its trail users. Next. Okay, thank you. So here are some of the things you'll find in the trail uh, maintenance basics page. First, it discusses the elements of trail maintenance. So what are the tools that you need to develop in order to operationalize trail maintenance, for example? Um, you need an inventory, you need to know what the physical assets are on the trail, you need an inspections checklist, you need people to know what they're looking out for, what, what, does, um, what does a good quality uh, asset look like and what does one that needs maintenance look like. Uh, maintenance priorities, there's limited time, there's limited resources, so how do you decide, what are your priorities. Uh, scheduling, so um, when are things done, is it weekly, is it monthly user reporting. Um, this is something that's important because people are out on the trails, they notice things. How do they get that information back to a trail manager? Um, tracking, so when a work uh, order is out, how do you know that work is done? Who is responsible? Uh, budgeting, like I said, it's limited resources. It's sometimes um, difficult to know before the trail is built. 
what it things will cost, but it's still an important exercise to try and get those cost estimates um, done um, because it, it really determines what even the design of the trail, like even what what as, what um, assets you'll put on the trail because you'll have to maintain them later. And of course, a maintenance pl a plan will contain all of these different aspects, will house them, will act as a reference for staff or anybody who's doing the maintenance, and will also show to the external audience that you care about maintenance, you care about safety. Next. Yeah, and speaking of who does the maintenance, um, the page discusses uh, different constituencies, different actors that participate in trail maintenance. So um, some organizations have the capacity to do all of this in-house. They have the staff, they have uh, the expertise to do it. Um, often this is like parks and recreation departments at a municipal or a county level. Um, but many, many trails rely on the input of volunteers. And in fact, volunteers keep some of these trails going, keep them in good shape. Um, what do you need to think about when you're working with volunteers? Um, and then some trails use contractors. Um, sometimes it's a task that's a little bit complex. It needs specialized equipment. It needs specialized expertise. So this can only be gotten maybe externally, but generally trails use um, a combination of all three for whatever, in whatever way works best for them. And the final topic that's covered in this on this page is maintaining rail with trail. What do you need to think about when your trail is located alongside an active railroad? So there's not just your maintenance to think about and your access to the railroad right of way, which often requires permission from the railroad, but you often have to think about how the railroad's maintenance affects yours. If they, for example, clear snow off the, the railroad itself, and it lands on your trail, you know, you have, there's a lot of other considerations. Um, on the right hand side is a picture of the Rails with Trails report that was released earlier by the FHWA. Um, it has much more information on the construction, and operation, maintenance of Rail with Trails. So I'd advise you to check that out. And on the right hand side of the trail building toolbox, you'll see a list of what we call related resources. All of these resources live in the, the resource library, which as its name suggests, is just a place where uh, documents are stored. So um, helpful documents like fact sheets, like manuals, like reports produced both by RTC and by external groups that we think would be useful for this audience can be found in the resource library. So the resource library uh, documents, one of the things I'll emphasize is that the documents are tagged. All of the documents in the library are tagged. So if you're looking for information on a certain topic, say maintenance, you can actually search the tags, uh, the tag maintenance and all of the documents that relate to that in one way or another will show up. Um, yeah. Yeah, and these are some of the examples of the things that you can find within the resource library. Some of them are reports, some are articles that our communications team has written for our magazine, uh, fact sheets, uh, examples of contracts between you know, jurisdictions, deciding how maintenance gets done. All of this good stuff can be found in the resource library. And this is just an invitation. If you have a resource that you've been using um, that you think would be really helpful as a reference for other trail managers, please feel free to share that with us. And I will turn this over to Tom to introduce us to some of the cost um, tools. Thank you, Yvonne. The rail trail and multi-use trail movement is, is relatively young. So it's not as too surprising that the costs of uh, the trails are not well documented as a, a discipline. Um, and it does make it difficult to compare practices for gaining cost savings and efficiencies, and especially to make the case for trails to our elected officials and others. Uh, too often, this lack of good information is interpreted as uh, the, the price is high um, for maintenance, which is not always the case. And most times, relatively, it's, it's not high. Um, I've been uh, um, working to capture uh, 
basic costs or baseline costs, or what I'll call routine costs today, uh, that is the hands-on tasks done at least once a year. Uh, the table I'm about to show has the cost of routine maintenance per mile of various types of multi-use trails that experience four seasons. It does not reflect issues such as operations and management, nor include trail costs term rebuilding or refurbishing, um, et cetera. Um, some of these often due to deferred maintenance. It does, however, give a general understanding of the wide range of routine costs to be useful for, for general comparisons and for a start. The table um, is a continuation of Rails to Trails Conservancy's 2015 study um, that you can, you, you can look at um, online now, um, which looked at over 200 trails. Um, while they are useful in determining standard maintenance tasks and their frequency, especially their frequency, uh, the over 100 uh, questions study showed that maintenance costs are not readily available. The study also determined that even when they are available, they are not always easy to under understand and compare to each other, and therefore uh, often not help them determining the costs of, of new trail maintenance. Uh, far too often, advocates just don't have the data when trying to make the case. This table represents the bundling of the before mentioned um, uh, study many questions into four broad categories surface, vegetation, amenities, and cleanliness, general cleanliness. While trail elements are similar from one to another, trail planners and man managers have various descriptions and methods for describing practices and costs. No one method is wrong, but the divergence in methodologies makes it difficult to compare costs among professionals. Often these methodologies and current costing resources available in um, our collective literature um, is um, not always accurate and, and, and can, can include some big items um, uh, like tunnels and bridge costs uh, and other and uh, deferred maintenance as well. Um, really the rebuilding costs, which isn't routine costs. Even though even more of a challenge is the fact that one trail could have tasks performed by a number of cross-sector partners. Uh, you have a state entity perhaps, um, you might have a contract contractors, not just one contractor, but multiple contractors, a local municipality, a volunteer group, and a nonprofit staff all working on the same corridor. Uh, it really gets hard to determine this, uh, the, the cost because of that. The trails portrayed here represent about one third of those we studied and we selected them for their completeness and na their na national representation um, and, and their validity. The numbers shown on the table are product of uh, this peer designed worksheet <clears throat> that captures essential maintenance tasks from all sectors. Other larger and more intricate templates were tested, but after mixed participation, we narrowed down the focus to those most fundamental tasks to ensure uh, ease of use. Again, routine tasks are defined as occurring at least once a year. These can include frequency. Uh, frequently scheduled tasks such as um, monthly mowing and daily trash pickup, or, or as needed tasks uh, uh, that might be a fallen tree or graffiti removal. Capturing the costs of sporadic or uh, sometimes termed periodic uh, tasks is somewhat difficult and hard to differentiate from routine. Often as budgets shrink, the periodic list uh, of tasks grows and sometimes becomes uh, deferred maintenance. This can result in the need to rebuild, potentially at many times the cost of routine maintenance, and unfortunately can impact the funding available for the construction of new trails. Given the change in frequency of uh, floods brought on by climate change, many, many managers now cite removal of debris and, and mud uh, as routine, and these costs are included here. Trail volunteers are essential to maintenance, uh, as we all know, and um, the ultimate success of, uh, of, the, uh, the, uh, of the trails um, across America. Without them, professional staff or contractors would need to be hired. Thus, the value of volunteer hours has been quantified um, and included uh, in, in this worksheet at the nationally recognized um, volunteer rate of uh, $25 an hour. Um, and as part of the total shown, 
um, here. Uh, because of that and, and other reasons, we have valued the um, paid staff, uh, be it um, state, uh, city, uh, local, um, or a, a nonprofit at $25 per hour also. The volunteer hours portrayed here are just routine tasks, not for one time free labor to construct, for example, uh, a kiosk. Uh, that may be a, a one time uh, thing or uh, trail patrolling or many other operational duties performed by uh, trail volunteers, essential, um, uh, of course, but not included here. Now that rail trails and other similar pathways are part of America's mainstream infrastructure, Rails to Trails Conservancy hopes to build on this information and invite you to complete our work our worksheet. I'd be happy to complete it with you, um, and you can contact me at tom at railstotrails.org. Thank you very much to those individuals who took the time to calculate some of these costs um, and to share it uh, with us. Um, one of those um, helpful people uh, in the forefront of this uh, is our next speaker. Joe Cyrenik, president and CEO of the Schuylkill River Development Corporation. He and his staff kept, uh, keeps excellent records. Um, and I was able to interview their outgoing uh, trail manager, as well as their, their new trail manager um, after several months on the job, um, and um, talk to their uh, volunteer uh, staff coordinator as well. Uh, and to get great guidance from, um, from Joe on the, the city of Philadelphia's um, uh, participation in this in this as, as well. So take it away, Joe. Thank you, Tom. Uh, as Kelly mentioned at the beginning, I'm with the Schuylkill River Development Corporation, uh, usually abbreviated as SRDC. We're a small nonprofit working with the city of Philadelphia, really their Department of Parks and Rec, to plan, design, construct, program, and maintain Schuylkill Banks which is an eight mile section of the much longer Schuylkill River Trail. Schuylkill Banks is actually a branding for this section of trail, which is totally within the city of Philadelphia and adjacent to the tidal portion of the Schuylkill River. It's a busy section of trail with over 2 million user trips in 2020. I'm gonna to talk to you about how we view maintenance and how our thinking on maintenance has evolved over the years. I'm not saying that we do it right. I'm just telling you what we do and you can evaluate how it might apply to you or not. So let me share my screen here with you. Can you see that? Yes, it looks good, Joe. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the uh, Rails to Trails maintenance cost uh, table here. Uh, we're talking today on maintenance, which is critically important, but sometimes, as you know, takes a backseat to initial design and programming decisions. Because of its role down the line, maintenance considerations should be included in project planning from day one. This will be a recurring theme. SRDC has six full-time employees, two of whom are focused almost exclusively on maintenance and operations. We operate pretty much independently of Parks and Rec, but there it is a partnership and they're the bigger and more important partner. They own the trail. So let's see. So I'm trying to figure out how to advance this now. And I'm having trouble. Try clicking on the screen to see if that or try using- There we go. Here we go. Thank you. So uh, our trail is a multi-purpose trail paved with asphalt. The predominant uses are walking, running, picnicking, or just hanging out and bicycling. Motor vehicles are prohibited except for maintenance. Schuylkill Sc Banks is sort of a, a trail, a rails with trail facility in that the trail and greenway are sandwiched in between the active freight railroad and the tidal river. This slide here on the left gives you a pretty good idea of our situation. The railroad runs freight trains adjacent to the trail, but they can also park freight trains adjacent to the trail. These trains can be long, 100 cars or more, and they can sit there for hours or sometimes days, 
which as you can imagine, greatly reduces access both for trail users, but even more so for maintenance or work vehicles. Maintenance responsibility on the trail and greenway is shared between the city of Philadelphia, really Parks and Rec and SRDC. Parks and Rec takes responsibility for what is defined as ordinary maintenance, which is defined as the task they regularly do on all city parks. This includes things like mowing the grass, snow removal, maintaining the path lighting and river bulkhead, fencing and safe furnishing like benches and receptacles. SRDC is responsible for extraordinary maintenance, which is defined as tasks over and above those normally done by the city on other parks. These include things like turf maintenance, so aeration, overseeding and fertilization, maintenance of plant beds like pruning and fertilization, maintenance of uh, uh, plant material, uh, mulching and weeding, leaf removal, things like this. Graffiti falls under the city's responsibility, but by and large, we do most of it unless it's someplace we can't reach, such as high up on a bridge girder. Trash and litter removal is also the city's responsibility on paper, but in practice, we usually pick it up, put it in a trash receptacle, and they service the trash can, that is take the trash away. We do have a written agreement with the city which spells out this stuff, which is a good idea in some respects, but could create some liability issues. So think about this before you commit anything to writing. I told you we have two full-time and maintenance people. This is year round. In the summer, we supplement this with two or three summer interns, usually high school or college kids who work between 15 and 40 hours a week, pretty much their choice, and they work alongside our regular staff. But in addition to that, we do a lot of work with volunteers, especially on the center city section of trail, which was the trail section that was the subject of this, of this maintenance chart. It's been a little different during the pandemic, but pre-pandemic, we had as many volunteers as we could use. This is partly because this is a nice place to work. It's along the river. It's generally in pretty good condition uh, and it's high visibility. Our volunteers can come from companies doing an office uh, volunteer day. Some come from organizations like the Engineers Club or XYZ Condominium Association. And sometimes it's just an individual or two who contact us looking to help out. Usually we try to get people for three to four hour shifts. We also have a couple of wonderful retired folks who commit to us for one or two days a week on a regular basis, almost year round. All of these people, uh, all of these people uh, are very important to what we do. Here's some slides of some of these volunteers at work, and you can see there's usually a group, but usually seven to 10 people is ideal. Sometimes people want to send us 75 people. That's really too much. We can't really deal with that. Uh, during the pandemic, we lost pretty much all of these organized groups because companies had closed their offices. We did keep some of the individual volunteers because they could work independently and social distance and feel relatively safe. With regard to volunteers, it's important you develop a work plan with them that makes sense. Most volunteers really wanna help, they wanna do good, and the worst thing you can do is just hand them a trash bag and say, go off on your own and pick up trash. But to develop a plan, you really have to understand how many people are coming, what their interests are, what their capabilities are, and how long they plan to work. And then you can develop a meaningful task or tasks have the proper tools, give the proper training, including a safety talk, and then you need to provide the needed supervision. At the beginning, it's helpful to have explained to them what they're going to do and why they're doing it. The better they understand the why, the better job they'll do. And then at the end, after they've finished, you need to point out how much better it looks, make them feel good about what they've done, and it usually always looks way better, so that when they wake up the next morning and they're a little bit sore, they feel good about it. I told you that our trail is asphalt, but it's also a pretty robust paving section. It's generally six inches of asphalt on six inches of stone subbase on compacted subgrade. This is what many communities use for regular roadways. And this adds to the initial cost for sure, 
But we recognize that vehicles need to be on the trail to do maintenance or additional construction. So we designed to accommodate pickup trucks for trash removal, lift trucks for lighting repairs, and the occasional crane or concrete truck. Here's some photographs of work being done on the trail, and you can see some pretty heavy equipment. The asphalt trail in Center City is about 15 years old now, and we've done very little to it in terms of maintenance, and it's held up pretty well. So maybe life cycle costing should be considered where you pay more upfront, but reap the benefits by having less maintenance. We believe that the key to a successful trail and greenway is providing a place where people can do what interests them. Walk the dog, throw a fris frisbee, sunbathe, things like that. Basically passive recreation. This is our idea of what Schuylkill Bank should be. And this is mainly what we strive for. But we do have some programming on the trail with kayaks, river boats, movie nights, and fish fests. And while we're not here to talk about programming today, organized activities do have maintenance ramifications. So if you're thinking about programming, think about how it will affect maintenance needs and plan for it. And while we're talking about programming and things related to it, maybe we should mention that we have a composting bathroom on the trail. There are no sewers on the west of the railroad track, so a composting toilet is the best we can do. I'm not an expert at this, but these things are designed for a certain volume of usage. If you stay within that usage, they work okay. If you exceed this volume, they can break down the product. They can't break down the product fast enough. So we don't really go out of our way to promote the use of this. And the majority of our trail users live and work nearby, so they don't really need it. But when you have a couple of hundred people at a movie night or a fish fest, you need something. And this is way better than porta potties. That's the good news. The bad news is that these things can be a maintenance nightmare. People graffiti the walls, they dump trash down the vault, they poop in the urinal, and they occasionally spray feces on the walls. It can be a difficult and disgusting maintenance issue. And as we cannot keep it open overnight, it needs to be opened and closed on a regular schedule, which is another task that takes more effort than you might think. When you're talking maintenance, you do what you can do. And maybe it, it can, maybe you just can't do everything. I'm not recommending against restrooms, but I will tell you this, we will think long and hard before we install another one. If you look at the chart here, our cost per mile is far higher than everyone else's on the chart. I don't understand why the others are so low, but I know some of the reasons that make ours high. Uh, first of all, the cost was based on the one mile center city section of trail. It's a very highly designed trail and it's a particularly expensive section. And that's what it was based on. We have access issues with the railroad and the river. Again, it's a high level of design. It's lighted, so we have electricity issues. It gets hit regularly with the graffiti almost every day. It has too many formal plant beds. Costs within the city are higher for everything. Uh, it's, there are structures there, including docks and maintenance sheds and bulkheads, and it's subjected to flooding, which I feel will become more common in the, in the future. So here's some pictures of uh, September 2nd, which was Hurricane Ida. Uh, up in the upper left is how the trail usually looks, and the lower right is that same section, about 10 o'clock in the morning. Everything's completely underwater. Here's the Schuylkill Banks boardwalk in the lower right-hand corner, a really nice facility. In the upper left-hand corner, this is how it looked on September 7th, completely underwater. This is a section of trail just down below. Lower right-hand corner is how we would like it to look. This upper left-hand corner is how it looked on September 2nd. You can even see the railroad to the extreme left is completely under water, about four feet of water. Uh, so all these things lead to the, this trail being expensive. And lastly, folks here in this area have high expectations and we strive to meet them. So if I were to leave you with some takeaways regarding maintenance, they would be maintenance is critical. It's every bit as important as capital programming. So include it in the initial planning. You need to have good people doing it. People who understand what you're trying to accomplish and have bought into the mission. 
With regard to staffing, when you're small like us, you can't afford any clunkers. Sometimes you add by subtracting. So while you want your staff to be good at their work and passionate about their work, the organization has an obligation to put them in a position to perform. We expect them to be out there all through the year. Uh, so winter clothing is important. We need to give them proper tools that are well, well maintained. We need safety equipment, uh, safety glasses, ear protection, things like that. The, a snowman's arms can take your eye out if you're not careful. Some organizations will be more geared up, more sophisticated than others. We're probably somewhere in the middle, but whatever your capabilities are, you need to be properly outfitted to perform at the optimal level for your size and abilities. Uh, and then this is very important, especially lately, build high out of the floodplain if you can. With a riverfront trail like ours, you can't always do it. But if you can, try to stay, stay dry during the flood. And if you can't, design stuff that can survive the flood. So here's some more photographs of our flood recovery. This is uh, a section of trail a little south of where Center City. Uh, when the waters receded, we had all this sediment or sludge on the trail. Uh, this is a plaza used by fishermen down on this section. It was covered with about two feet of sandy kind of silt. We're not really sure where that came from. I mean, it came from the river, but uh, this means we really have extensive cleanup work. Here's people doing some cleanup, trying to get this, this mud that's put on top of the thing cleaned up. And here's some volunteers working, doing the same thing. The picture on the right shows that the fencing between us and the railroad was completely almost knocked over by the floodwaters. That's how strong this stuff was. Uh, planning beds uh, can easily go to weed, and most trail organizations can't up, keep up with this. Tall grasses are a good alternative, and trees are always good and relatively low maintenance, but be careful not to plant them too close to the trail, both because of potential root damage and also because of safety. Looking good on day one is important, but so is looking good in year five. And lastly, we try to put ourselves in the shoes of the trail user. What do they think about the job we're doing? And if need be, how can we do better? And then we try not to take criticism of our work too personally, and we get it. We try to listen to what people are saying, and if we can, approve something, uh, and then it's a plus. So that's really all I have. I believe there'll be questions at the end for time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, but for now, I'm turning this back to Tom. Thanks for that terrific overview, Joe, of um, a very, very highly urbanized and, and uh, well-used trail. Now let's shift to the far end of the spectrum and look at a rural trail. Uh, you see the uh, Schuylkill Banks uh, next to the Lemoyne, Lemoyle Valley Rail Trail uh, in Vermont, just for comparisons. We don't have enough time today, unfortunately, to cover the sort of in-between uh, suburban trails today, um, but you can go into our toolbox afterward and see the other examples in the full table. Um, for background, the Lamoille Valley is 35, 34 miles long in northern Vermont, and when fully built by 2023, will be 90 miles long. The state uh, DOT, VTRANS, uh, has taken over construction uh, since the state fully funded it last year uh, for the tune of about um, $16 million um, to finish it out. Prior to, to that, the Vermont area snow travelers, um, or VAST, was the trail manager um, since this is a very popular snowmobile track. Um, it also uh, receives help from the friends of the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. I developed these numbers with uh, VAST before the, uh, the DOT uh, took over. Um, construction has stopped for the winter. Snowmobile, snowmobile use will continue to be a big part uh, when the trail is complete. And as with most trails, I believe snowmobile use is compatible 
with uh, all other uh, user, users and uses. Um, so let's uh, talk about uh, the last four items on, on this list a little more in depth. Um, and and uh, I have about a half a dozen photos to um, relay what um, I see uh, uh, up at the uh, Lamoille Valley, um, the, the surface, the structure of vegetation and amenities and, and cleanliness. <clears throat> This is a stone dust trail um, that is main that uh, is still maintained, um, but that will change um, by the vast staff. Not that's a nonprofit statewide um, organization that promoting uh, uh, snowmobiling, and um, and they hire um, lots of contractors. Also, um, their biggest issue actually is beaver blockage of their over 500 culverts. Uh, they pay contractors and they also um, uh, uh, work with the Vermont Youth Corps. Um, and this um, adds up to about $37,000 a, a year to um, keep these um, culverts operating. Um, the grass is mowed um, uh, most times by the towns, uh, about three times a year, and uh, mostly a tow behind mower uh, is used. Um, sometimes it's, it's difficult to draw a line between grass and brush, um, uh, and sometimes they might have to go in there with a, a little bigger equipment once in a while, and that would probably be a contractor. Um, the snowmobile clubs take care of down trees um, all year round, and the vast staff spends um, over 200 hours, almost 200 hours a year cleaning debris with a leaf blower. Um, and that leaf uh, blowing takes about um, two hours per mile. So a lot of work and maybe when um, this becomes, um, uh, well, it is, it, it is owned by the state, um, but when it becomes uh, fully uh, uh, built out, um, maybe they'll have uh, other methods for, for doing it. Some of this that's, uh, that's more uh, efficient since it's gonna be uh, more than twice as long. Since the line uh, is owned by the state, and it also is rail banked, fortunately, um, the state DOT ins inspects the 50 of the 94 bridges in total, the 50 bridges that, that require inspection. So that's, that's a, a, big, a big, big savings. Um, uh, in our uh, worksheet, we, we did capture uh, bridge inspection. Um, Quite often, groups get in-kind uh, inspections. Uh, they don't do all bridges every year. It could be usually on a five or 10-year basis. Um, sometimes it's, it's let uh, uh, go a little bit, um, but um, uh, they'll do doom in chunks. If you have 50 bridges, you may do 10 a year, and then you're on a five-year five -year cycle, et cetera. <clears throat> Uh, they also have some, some beauties like this historic uh, railroad uh, covered bridge. Um, not too many of these left in the country. I think there's a few in New Hampshire as well. Um, but uh, this is on the um, unopened section as, as, um, uh, as you're looking at it. Took this photo last week when I was, when I was up there. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's gonna be something that people are really, really gonna enjoy. Um, this photo is just about as close as you're going to get to any colorful color added uh, by uh, humankind um, in, in terms of uh, uh, graffiti or, or litter. Not that this is, is, is either, but uh, you, you've heard of um, a sign, sign litter, but uh, th these are very necessary. Uh, the trail users um, do keep the trail very clean. Um, the Lamoral has a, a lower level of, of I'd say extra amenities at this time, except for, for a lot of signage um, as compared to other suburban and urban trails. Um, they have uh, uh, almost 400 crossings, uh, road crossings in that 90 miles. So signage uh, can be very expensive. You also might wanna notice the, the small blue sign in the, in the right top uh, section of the picture on that tree. That small blue blaze is, um, designates this as part of the 300 mile 
Hadamont cross country skiing trail that goes from Massachusetts up the spine of Vermont all the way to Canada. Um, and that is just open, um, and most of it is not on rail trail. Um, uh, but uh, that, tr that trail is only open when it snows. Um, uh, but in this case, uh, they're, they're using um, the, the Lamoille uh, to make connections. Um, and I, I point this out just to show again that uh, the mix of snowmobile um, users and other users uh, is, 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 goes very well. And I have seen that several times on other types of right of ways um, that uh, VAST maintains um, that the Catamount, um, the Catamount Trail uh, uses. Lastly, um, as Joe mentioned, flooding is becoming more common and maybe, maybe even routine. So I'd like to finish by pointing out that uh, Vermont, for example, is, is being somewhat proactive. Um, in this case, uh, a six mile section of the trail's profile, the Lamoille Valley um, Rail Trail was lowered to bring it more in line with the surrounding area's floodway and let the water go where it needs to go without harming the trail surface, uh, except for, of course, here, uh, unless you have waders, um, you miss a few days of, of trail use. Um, and uh, having to build, uh, rather do this, rather than have to build uh, large culverts uh, and, and, uh, and maintain, uh, maintain them. Uh, this reconnected more than 2,000 acres of historic floodplain at a, at a cost of a relatively cheap cost of uh, $550,000 um, for 200 acres. That's pretty good. Um, thus a win for the trail and a win for the surrounding lands and structures that will be less impacted. Um, there's a lot more to share about the Lamoille, but I'm, I'll need to stop there. Um, and so we can get to some questions, but please contact me with any follow-up. Uh, and then now let me um, return it back to, um, to Kelly. Thank you, Tom, Joe, and Yvonne. Great presentation. We're getting a lot of good questions in the Q&A um, that I'm just going to start because we did have some questions to help clarify the information in the table, Tom, that, that we're referring to. And just wanted to clarify that all of those figures are cost per mile per year. That is correct. Great. And then one other quick clarifying question is just to um, define what you mean by stone dust. Some of the surface types listed in the, the table are okay. so, indicated so some, as stone dust. Yeah, yeah. Sort of a what's called a 2A modified, um, you know, depending on where you get it, it may have more limestone than other places, uh, but it's a, a crushed stone um, that if set up properly, um, you can take uh, the only thing you can't do on it is um, inline skate, really. Uh, but it, you, you, it allow all other uses, even even skinny tires. Great. We have a few questions that came in beforehand and in the Q and A um, related to mowing, and so this you know this could go to both. Tom to speak to maybe the more rural example and Joe to speak to your experience in Philadelphia on the school kill trail. Um, the, curious if there are standard mowing widths on a, on a rail trail or multi-use trail in either setting um, and does mowing occur on both sides of the drainage ditch? Um, probably if you're in a, in a more rural setting there. Standard well, mowing I width. Yeah, Joe, you, you may have your own standards, um, and I wouldn't even call them standards, but uh, in, in rural cases, um, I hear from managers that they're just trying to cut back. I mean, it all depends on the slope and things like that, too, and, and how close the trees are, but they're, they're basically trying to do about three or four feet back. Um, sometimes it's, it's, even, it's even two. And, and they, would, they would be cutting on both sides. It, again, depending on the slope um, mm -hmm. and, and um, tree, tree factors. Mm -hmm. Joe, did you wanna comment on the, the mowing width or an, an, a related question, how you deal with grass encroachment on the more urban trails? 
So, so let me let me take that one. We don't really have any drainage ditches to speak of. So we're 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 just the city's just coming in and mowing the grass, you know, uh, every couple of weeks, and that can vary depending on their budget. But uh, we we try to do a three inch cut on our regular lawn area. But with regard to uh, grass encroaching on the trail, we really don't have that problem either. Um, we certainly have never done any uh, edging of the trail and would, would never get down to that high level of, of, of maintenance. A, a bigger problem we have is, you know, runners like to run on a softer surface than asphalt. So they usually end up running on the edge of the trail. And this basically kills the grass, but it also creates over time a little bit of a runner's rut. Uh, and this can be two or three or sometimes even four inches deep. So it's the trail sort of falls right off there, which becomes dangerous because the next runner can easily turn his or her ankle on that on that rut. So our task is not so much, we, we, we wish we could get some grass up against the trail, but we can't. And one of our regular tasks is, is to come in and fill in those ruts with just uh, topsoil. And we do that, you know, whenever it's needed, but in season, it's it can be every six weeks or so. And also just related to, you know, condition of the, the trail surface, and this is more in probably urban areas with asphalt trails. Have Joe, have you had to repave the asphalt due to cracks and upheavals from tree roots? And, and do you often see the need to repave? We, it's 15 years on Center City, which is the trail that you were looking at. Uh, we, we've never repaved it. We've never even recoded it. Uh, we do not have any trees planted close to the trail to create root damage. Um, you don't want to do that because of the root damage, but you also don't want to do that uh, because if somebody falls off their bicycle, they may eat a little bit of asphalt, but you don't want them clunking their head up against the tree trunk. So our trails held up really, really well, and it, it, gets, it gets some pretty heavy vehicular traffic because when PennDOT needs to come in and repair a bridge over the river, they're using that trail. So we're pretty happy with it. Recoding it would be, sounds easy, but you know, then, you're, then you're covering up all your pavement markings. We don't have a lot of pavement markings, but we do have some. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm retired before that has to happen. But 15 years, haven't really hardly touched it. It's in really good shape. That's great. I, I, could, I could add um, asphalt, um, ru tree roots ruining asphalt is probably um, the biggest, um, biggest issue in terms of uh, trails needing to be rebuilt. Um, and um, it, 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 even though it doesn't look like, um, and Joe's not there yet because he they planted some trees that are, are, are really haven't spread out that far. But at some point, um, you know, I, I would say to Joe, do some trenching. Um, just make sure you, you don't impact that asphalt. Um, it's great to have a canopy, um, but the other side of that is you've got to maintain and, and ditch um, and cut those roots. Um, Put some um, some herbicide on the end. Uh, there's there's some stuff that's that's very inert, um, and and um, rather than wait for um, damage and then go in and take a section out, uh, that's kind of like after after the fact. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the, the, our literature um, is kind of old at this point. I'm trying to get a better handle on this, um, but we had um, I think some of the asphalt trails. Uh, 20, 30 years ago um, that only lasted five years and, and their costs, and it was really a cost of rebuilding the trail, not routine costs, um, but rebuilding the trail from scratch. And there's many examples of this uh, because the tree roots weren't, um, uh, weren't uh, taken care of. And so you see in the literature, oh, a asphalt trail will, will last five to 15 years. Not true. Um, if, if you maintain it well, and Joe is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. this, this question um, from Michael early kind of builds on the, the idea of replacing surface. Um, and I wanted to also thank Michael for his comment about 
using timed locks on restrooms that open at sunrise and close to reduce vandalism and, and homeless occupancy. So um, that was just a, an idea that was passed along in the Q&A. But his question is around if there are any work measurement standards for maintenance or any standard for surface restoration. So again, you're kind of speaking to this, but are there any standards for replacing crushed gravel every X number of years or other surface type every X number of years? Anything that you've seen and maybe, you know, Tom in your interviews with trail managers or Yvonne that you may have seen in collecting some of the resources for the toolbox? I'd like to be definitive, um, but it sometimes kind of depends on the, the makeup of, of the rock. Um, that trail, uh, where it's located, you know, how it was, it was built. Um, I mean, there's crushed stone um, uh, trails that, um, you know, that are fine after, after 10 years. Um, I think you do want to do, you know, look for replenishment um, and sometimes um, that's in large sections. Sometimes it's surprising because it won't be a large section and you don't understand why it's happening here or not over, over there. Um, but uh, it's, it's um, I, 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 I don't know. It's one of those things that I just don't have a good handle on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen studies here and there within uh, some of which are in toolbox, um, tagged surface. So you can also search that if uh, you have a specific surface question, but they, they're standards, but I don't know that they are universally applicable and the range is really wide, like seven to 15 years is like a lot of, the big range. So yeah, I don't know that um, there's like one definitive source for that. Thanks. Kind of I, I would say yeah. I would say with regard to us, we're, we're more reactive rather than proactive. I mean, we wait mm -hmm. for a problem to happen. Uh, I, I wish we could, I wish we could have a schedule and sort of be proactive on some of these things, but we just, it's, we can't keep up with what's a problem, let alone trying to keep problems from happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any maintenance tasks that are um, able to kind of, we're able to project costs based on the frequency of use of the trail? So there was a question about standards based on user count. So are there any maintenance activities that you might adjust, you know, in your kind of budgeting based on the amount of use that trail gets? Geez, that's a, that's a good, good question. I, I, I can't really speak to that. You know, I guess that's the wear and tear factor. If, um, you know, Joe has, what, what do you have now? A million point seven people a year, well, Joe, we, had, we had 2 million in 20, <laughs> we went over 2 million in 2020. Now that was because a lot of people were working from home on the trail. Uh, but I, I would think the one thing is litter. I mean, the more people you have, the more litter you have. It's just, um, we have trash cans regularly uh, spaced uh, pretty frequently. And, you know, some people are really great about cleaning up after themselves. And other people, you yeah, have to wonder, you know, what they were thinking when they left all their lunch <laughs> down on the in the lawn area uh, after they left. So Joe, how, how, how often do you pick up trash? Does a city pick up trash? So generally we pick it up and, and that's the one thing, that's the single most important task that we have. We The first thing our maintenance person does when he comes in in the morning and we're on the trail seven days a week, probably 350 days a year. The first thing they do is get in a golf cart and ride the entire trail, pick up every piece of litter that they see, every single piece. While they're doing that, they're also looking to see what else may have happened overnight. And sometimes what they'll find is a graffiti problem, because uh, that's what happens at night. Um, and then and how, often, the next, how often do they pick up the trash receptacles? So that varies. Uh, we, you know, Parks and Rec does it. And we, they are pretty good at figuring out how they, how often they have to do it. So if the trash can is overflowing, of course they have to do it. If it's 75% um, full, they, they should do it because then it's going to be overflowing. Uh, in Center City, which is our busiest section in, in season, which is spring, summer, and fall, they do it every day, sometimes twice a day. In the wintertime, maybe once a week is enough. And they've pretty much been able to figure it out um, because 
time it's important. If you don't pick it up and the trash can starts to overflow, then people don't know where to put their stuff. So they start piling it up around the trash can or placing it on top of the trash can. That's all they can do. But then when the wind comes, it blows it all over. So you're picking up that litter two or three times if you let that happen. Yeah. We have some um, questions around kind of man management structure, right? And we've talked about different um, examples of maybe a municipality, county or state government managing and maintaining parts of the trail in combination with volunteer groups, right? Um, in thinking about the paid staff time that is spent on trails, do you have any idea um, in your conversations, Tom or, or Joe, just in your experience, the percent of that staff time, paid staff time that is dedicated to the trail? So we're assuming, you know, that there are maintenance personnel that are also responsible for maintaining maybe other city parks. Um, any, any idea of, you know, where you have a, a single jurisdiction managing and maintaining a trail, how they're staffing that, ma that maintenance need for the trail? So, let me start. So our personnel mm -hmm. are, are totally dedicated to maintenance, the thing. So basically 40 hours a week, seven days a week, we're, we're working just on the trail in the Greenway. That's, that's their, for the most part, that's their only job, except maybe helping with a little programming. So if it's a movie night, they help set that up and take that down. With regard to the city, I would say the city parks and rec people, they have 11,000 acres of parkland to take care of. Some of that is wooded land, which doesn't take, you know, a lot of, a lot of care, but a lot of it is manicured uh, landscape. Uh, we are on the trail, I told you, seven days a week. I would say they're on the trail, except for picking up trash, they're on the trail maybe once every three weeks. That's so awesome. they, I'm sure they're work. I'm not saying they're not working. They're, they're doing mm -hmm. it, but they, they can only give our section of the trail maybe once every, every 25 days or something like that. That's how, that's how stretched thin they are. And that's a problem. Yeah. We're, we're coming up on time at one o'clock. There are a lot of really great comments and questions in the chat. Um, we're going to try to answer some of those. RTC will try to answer some of those after um, the webinar today, but I just want to leave the group with kind of one final question or thought um, as we were looking through some of your slides, Joe, on you know the, the flooding occurrences on the trail and in thinking about um, just how often RTC is contacted by trail managers who are now having to deal with climate related events. Um, and that is changing the nature of how they budget for maintenance. It's changing the nature of how tra trails might be planned, right? So just any thoughts on, um, you know, especially for trail, the trail planners in our audience who are maybe looking um, and working with communities to develop new trails in areas that might have to experience um, and plan for resiliency. How do we plan and design for more climate resilient trails? And how are these practices going to affect maintenance practices and costs? I'm saying if you, if you, have a, if you are able to build it high out of the floodplain, or the, um, you, you, you should do that if you can. We're a riverfront trail, so we can't always do that. But if that boardwalk were built two foot higher <laughs> elevation, it would probably not have had, well, maybe, maybe in the last one it would, but in most cases it would not have water on the, on the surface of the, uh, of, of the, the deck there. Um, on new sections of trails, we get further down the river. The bank is steeper. We can get higher. We're going to get higher if we can. Well, in Center City, um, it is what it is, and I would just say build it as robust as you can. Make those, make those railings able to be taken to be able to hit with a, a tree trunk coming down a raging river or maybe a little refrigerator floating down the river. We see all kinds of crazy things. Just build it as strong as you can do it. And you're not going to beat Mother Nature, but we should make her work as hard as she can to, to grow in something that we have. 
Thanks, Joe. Any any other final thoughts, Tom and Yvonne? Sounds like we need another webinar on sounds resiliency. Like we, sounds <laughs> like we do need another webinar on resiliency. And just in these final seconds that we have, if um, anyone in the audience has an example of either a planned or existing trail um, where you are using resiliency practices in, in the design or in your maintenance plan, we'd love to hear about that. Um, I wanted to thank our panelists for the information. Again, you'll be able to view this webinar on railstotrails.org. You can also share um, examples or thoughts, comments at railtrails at railstotrails.org. We look forward to bringing you more webinars in 2022 and including one on maintenance practices and um, climate resiliency. So thank you, Tom, Yvonne, and Joe. Thank you everyone who joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Mm -hmm.